says I should not have any serious conversation after seven. It makes me talk in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> talk in your sleep, sir? What does that matter? You are not married. No, father, I am not married. <clears throat> that is what I have come to talk to you about, sir. You have got to get married and at once. Why, when I was your age, I had been an inconsolable widower for three months and was already paying my addresses to your admirable mother. Damn, sir! It is your duty to get married. You can't be always living for pleasure. Every man of position is married nowadays. Bachelors are not fashionable anymore. You must get a wife. Look where your friend Robert Chilton has got to by hard work and a sensible marriage to a good woman. Why don't you imitate him, sir? Why don't you take him for your model? I think I shall, Father. I wish you would, sir. Then I should be happy. At present, I make your mother's life miserable on your account. You are very heartless. Very hard. I hope not. Father. And it is high time for you to get married. You are 34 years of age, sir. Yes, Father, but I only admit to 32. <laughs> 31 and a half, and I have a really good butt nose. I tell you, you are 34. There is a draft in your room besides, which makes your conduct worse. Why did you tell me there was no draft, sir? There is a draft. I feel it distinctly. <clears throat> so do I, Father. It is a dreadful draft. I will come to you in the morning, Father. We can talk over anything you like. Let me help you on with your cloak, Father. No. 
sir, I have called this evening for a definite purpose, and I intend to see you through at all costs, to my help or yours. Achoo! Put down my clothes, sir! Certainly, pop. But uh, let us go into another room. There is a dreadful draught here. Pete, is there a good fire in the smoking room? Yes, my lord. Come in here, father. Your sneezes are quite heart rending. Well, sir, I suppose I have the right to sneeze when I choose. <laughs> you really always understand what you say. Of course, father. If I listen attentively. Listen attentively. <laughs> See the pop. <laughs> there is a lady coming to see me this evening on very particular business. <coughs> when she arrives, show her into the drawing. You understand? <coughs> yes, my lord. It is a matter of the greatest importance, Phyllis. I understand, my lord. No one else is to be admitted. I understand, my lord. Under any circumstance. I understand. Oh, hmm. <laughs> ah, well, that is probably the lady. I shall see her myself. Well, sir, am I to wait attendance on you? In a moment, Father, do excuse me. Well, Phipps, remember my instructions. Into that room. Yes, my lord. What name, madam? Your name, madam? Is Lord Gorby not here? His lordship is engaged at present with Lord Cavendish, madam. How very filial. His lordship told me to ask you, madam, to be kind enough to wait in the drawing room. His Lordship will come to you there. Lord Goring expects me. Yes, ma'am. Are you quite sure? His Lordship told me that the lady called. I was to ask her to wait in the drawing room. His Lordship's directions on the subject were very precise. How very thoughtful of you. To expect the unexpected shows a thoroughly modern intellect. Oh, how dreary a bachelor's drawing room is. I shall have to alter all this. No, I don't care for the lamp. It is far too glaring. Lights and candles. Certainly, madam. And I do hope that the candles have a very becoming shape. We have had no complaints about them, madam, as yet. <laughs> I wonder what woman he is expecting. It would be so delightful to catch him. Men always look so silly when they are being caught. And they are always being caught. <laughs> what an interesting room. What an interesting picture. Who on earth writes to him on pink paper? Wait a minute. I recognize this handwriting. Why, it is Gertrude Chilterns. I remember it perfectly. I want you, I trust you, I am coming to you, girl. I want you, I trust you, I am coming to you, Gertrude. The candles in the drawing room are lit, madam, as you directed. Thanks. I trust the shades were you to your liking. They are the most becoming we have. They are the same as his lordship uses himself <coughs> when dressing for dinner. Oh, well, then I am sure that they shall fit perfectly right. Thank you, madam. My dear brother, if I am to get married, surely you will allow me to choose the time, place, and pattern? Particularly the person. That is a matter for me, sir. You would probably make a very poor choice. It is I who should be consulted, not you. There is property at stake. It is not a matter for affection. Affection comes later on in married life. <laughs> yes, in married life, affection comes when two people thoroughly dislike each other, father, doesn't it? Well, certainly, sir. I, I mean, certainly not, sir. <laughs> you are talking very foolishly tonight. What I say is that marriage is a matter of common sense. Oh, my dear Arthur, what a piece of good luck meeting you on the doorstep. Your servant, he just told me you were not at home. Extraordinary. <laughs> well, uh, the fact is that I'm horribly busy tonight, Robert, and I have given orders that I was not home to anyone. Even my father had a comparatively cold reception. Complained of a draught for the whole time. I mean, you must be at home to me, Arthur. You're my best friend. Perhaps by tomorrow you'll be my own friend. My wife has discovered everything. Ah, I guess as much. Really? How? Oh, uh, merely by something in the expression of your face as you came in. But um, who told her? Mrs. Chibi herself. And now the woman I love knows that I began my career on an act of low dishonesty. And I sold the secret that had been entrusted to me as a man of honor. And you heard nothing yet in response from Vienna, from your wife? Yes, I got a telegram from the first secretary at 8 o'clock tonight. Well, 
Nothing is absolutely known against her. On the contrary, she occupies a rather high position in society. It is a sort of open secret that Baron Arnheim left her the greater portion of his immense fortune. Beyond that, I can know nothing. She doesn't turn out to be a spy. Oh, spies are of no use nowadays. The profession is over. The newspapers do the work instead. Thunderingly well they don't. Mm -hmm. But I am part of the first. Mary, please, and Hawkins outside. Certainly. Let me. Thanks. I don't know what to do, Arthur. I don't know what to do. And you're my only friend. But what a friend you are. The one friend I can trust. I can't trust you, can I? My dear Robert, of course. Fips, <coughs> bring some Hawkins outside. Yes, my lord. And Fips. Yes, my lord. Will you excuse me for a moment, Robert? I want to give some directions, my servant. Certainly. And that lady called us. Tell her that I have suddenly been called out of town. Do you understand? Tell her that I am not home this evening. The lady is in that room, my lord. You told me to show her into that room, my lord. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a mess I mean. <laughs> Though. Arthur, tell me what I should do. My life seems to have crumbled about me. Robert, you love your wife, don't you? You love her more than anything in the world. I used to think ambition the great thing. It is not. Love is the great thing in the world. But I'm defamed in her eyes. There's a wide gulf between us now. She has found me out, Arthur. Has she never in her life done some folly, some indiscretion, that she should not forgive your sin? My wife? Never. She does not know what weakness or temptation is. No, she stands apart, as good women do, pitiless in her perfection, cold and stern and without mercy. But I love her, Arthur. We are childless, and I have no one else to love. No one else to love me. Perhaps if God had sent his children, she might have been kinder to me. She has cut my heart in two. Don't let us talk of it. I was brutal to her this evening. But well, I suppose when sinners talk and say they are brutal always, I said to her things that were hideously true, on my side, from my standpoint, from the standpoint of men. Don't let us talk of that. Your wife will forgive you, Robert. Perhaps at this moment she is forgiving you. She loves you, Robert. Why should she not forgive? God grant it. But there is something more I have to tell you, Arthur. Park and Seltzer, sir. Is your carriage here, Robert? No, I walked from the club. So Robert will take my cab, please. Yes, my lord. You don't mind my sending you away, Robert? Arthur, you must let me stay for at least five minutes. Look, I've made up my mind of what I'm going to do tonight in the house. The debate on the Archetype Canal is to begin at 11. Nothing. Someone has been listening. No. <laughs> no, there's no one there. There is someone. There are lights in the room and the door's ajar. Someone has been listening to every secret of my life. Arthur, what does this mean? Robert, you are excited, unnerved. I tell you, there is no one in that room. Sit down, Robert. You give me your word that there's no one there? Yes. Your word of honor? Yes. <laughs> Arthur, let me see for myself. No! No! If there's no one there, then why should I not look into that room? Arthur, uh -huh. you must let me look into that room. Let me know that no eavesdropper has led my life secret. Arthur, uh, you don't realize what I'm going through. Robert! This must stop! I tell you, there is no one in that room that is enough! It is not enough! I insist on going into this room! No! You've told me that there's no one there, so what reason do you have for refusing no, me? For God's sakes, don't! There is someone there! <laughs> And I don't care who is there. I will know who it is to whom I told my secret and my shame. For God's sake, his own wife. <laughs> <laughs> what explanation have you to give me for the presence of that woman here? Robert, I swear to you, on my honor, that that woman is stainless and guiltless of all offense towards you. <laughs> You are suited to each other. She, corrupt and shameful. You, for 
force as a threat. Treacherous as an enemy. No, it is not true. Call it. It is not true. Before heaven, in her presence and in yours, I will explain all. Let me pass, sir. You have lied enough upon your word of honor. Good evening, Lord Gawain. Mrs. Cheatman! <laughs> what you're doing in my drawing room. Really, Lissity, I have a perfect passion for this being through evil. One always says such wonderful things. Well, I'm glad you've called. I'm going to give you some good advice. Oh, pray don't. One should never give a woman anything that she can't wear in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> I see you're quite as willful as you used to be. Far more. I've great deal of food. I've had more experience. Well, too much experience is a dangerous thing. Tell me. Have you come here to sell me Robert Chilton's letter? To offer it to you, on conditions. How did you guess? Well, because you haven't mentioned the subject. Have you got it with you? Oh, no, you see, a well-made dress has no pockets. <laughs> well, what is your price for it, then? How absurdly English of you. The English think that a checkbook can solve every problem in life. Why, my dear Arthur, I have much more money than you have. And quite as much as well, but children can get a hold of. Money is not what I want. Well, what do you want, then, Mrs. Cheek? Why don't you call me Laura? I don't like the name. <laughs> <laughs> you used to adore it. Yes, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, you loved me once. Yes. And you asked me to be your wife. Well, that was the natural result of my loving you. <laughs> <laughs> and you threw me over because you saw, or said you saw, poor old Lord Mortlake trying to have a violent flirtation with me in the conservatory of Tenby. I have the impression that my lawyer settled that matter with you on certain terms, dictated by yourself. I was poor at the time. You were rich. Well, quite so. And that is why you pretended to love me. Poor old Lord Mortlake, who only had two topics of conversation, his wife and his goat. I could never really make out which of the two he was talking about. <coughs> he used the most violent language of the <coughs> Well, Arthur, you were silly. Why, Lord Mortlake was never anything more to me than an amusement. I loved you, Arthur. My dear Mrs. Chee, you have always been far too clever to know anything about love. Arthur. I did love you, and you loved me, and love is a wonderful thing. I suppose, though, that when a man has once loved a woman, he will do anything for her except continue to love her? Yes, except that. I'm tired of living abroad. I want to come back to London. I want to have a charming house here. Besides, I've arrived at the romantic stage. When I saw you last night at the children, I knew you were the one person I've ever cared for, if I've ever cared for anybody. And so, on the day that you marry me, I will hand you back Robert Chilton's letter. That is my offer. I will give it to you now, if you promise to marry me. Now? Tomorrow. Are you really serious? Quite serious. So I should make you a very bad husband. Oh, I don't mind bad husbands. I've had two, and they've amused me immensely. You mean that you've amused yourself immensely, don't you? So, you are going to let your greatest friend, Sir Robert Chilton, be ruined? Rather than marry someone who has considerable attractions left, I thought you would have risen to some great heights of self-sacrifice, Arthur. I think you should. And the rest of your life you can spend in Contemplating your own affections. <laughs> oh, but I do that as it is. <laughs> and self sacrifice is something that should be put down by law. It is so demoralizing to the people who one sacrifices oneself, and they always go to the bad. Well, Arthur, I suppose this romantic interview may be regarded <coughs> as at an end. You do admit it was romantic, don't you? For the privilege of being your wife. I was ready to give up a great prize, the climax of my diplomatic career. You decline. Very well. If Sir Robert does not uphold my offer, I expose him. 
What action? You mustn't do that. It would be vile. Horrible. Infamous. Oh, don't you speak words. They mean so little. It is a commercial transaction. That is all. There is no good mixing sentimentality in it. I offer Sir Robert a certain thing. He doesn't pay my price. He shall pay the world a greater price. There is nothing more to be said. I must go now. Goodbye. Won't you shake hands? Uh, with you? Uh, no. <laughs> Your transaction with Robert Chilton may pass as a loathsome commercial transaction, but you seem to have forgotten that you came here tonight to talk of love. You, whose lips desecrated the word love, went this afternoon to the house of one of the most noble and gentle women in the world to degrade her husband in her eyes, with poison in her heart, and it may be to spoil her soul. <laughs> that I cannot forgive. That was horrible. And for that there can be no forgiveness. Oh, Arthur, you are unjust to me. Believe me, you are quite unjust. Why, I didn't go to talk to Gertrude Chilton at all. I merely called with Lady Murphy to ask for an ornament, a jewel that I had lost the night before could be found with the Chilterns. If you don't believe me, you can ask Lady Murphy. She will tell you it is true. The scene that occurred happened after Lady Murphy had left and was really forced upon me by Gertrude's rudeness and sneers. I called, oh, a little out of malice, if you like, but only to ask whether her diamond brooch had been found the night before. That is the origin of the whole affair. A diamond brooch? Yes. How do you know? <laughs> because it is found, in point of fact. I found it myself. I'm stupidly forgot to tell the butler anything about it as I was leaving. It is in this drawer. Here it is. This is the brooch, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm very happy to have it found. It was a present. And won't you wear it? Certainly. If you pin it in. Why do you put it on as a bracelet? I didn't know it could be worn as a bracelet. Really? No, but it does look very well on me as a bracelet. Yes, much better than when I saw it last. When did you see it last? Oh, ten years ago, on Lady Berkshire, from whom you stole it. What do you mean? I mean that you stole that ornament from my cousin, Mary Berkshire, to whom I gave it when she was married. Suspicion fell on a wretched servant who was sent away in disgrace. I recognized it last night and determined to say nothing about it until I had found the thief. And I have found the thief now. And I've heard her own confession. It is not true. You know it is true. Why, thief is written across your face at this moment. I will deny the whole affair from beginning to end. I will say that I have never seen the wretched thing, but it was never in my possession. The drawback of stealing a thing, Mrs. Cheatley, is that one never knows how wonderful the thing that one steals is. You can't get that bracelet off unless you know where the spring is. And I see you don't know where the spring is. It is very difficult to find. <laughs> you brute! You count. Oh, don't use big words. They mean so little. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm going to ring for my servant. He's an admirable servant. Always comes in a moment one rings for him. And when he comes, I will tell him to fetch the police. The police? <laughs> what for? Well, tomorrow, the Berkshires will prosecute you. That is what the police are for. Get it! I will do anything you want. Oops. Anything in the world you want. Give me Robert Chilton's letter. So, let me have more time to think. Give me Robert Chilton's letter. I don't have it on me. I will give it to you tomorrow. You know you're lying. Give it to me at once. This is it? Yes. Well, for so well-dressed a woman, Mrs. G. Day, you have moments of admirable common sense. I congratulate you.
glass of water, please? Oh, certainly. Good night, Hope. 